Welcome to lecture number three. Uh, in this one, we're going to pick up some more contemporary artists and art movements. Uh, so we'll start with Robert Maplethorpe, who, as you can probably tell, is a photographer. And this is his self-portrait in 1988. Uh, at this time, he was dying of AIDS. Uh, so he's very, very thin. And he was doing what's called, um, in earlier art styles, a memento mori, or memento mori, sorry, uh, which means a reminder of death. Uh, so at this time, AIDS, um, which had affected at the particular time mostly um, gay men and intravenous drug users, um, was a death sentence. There was no way to treat it, and everybody who got AIDS uh, ended up dying. Um, so he knew even before he died that he didn't have a chance because he had seen many of his friends go the same way. Uh, so in this photograph, he wears black so that he's like a floating skull, almost like the skull that he's holding uh, in his hand towards the um, viewer. So one of the things that he's most famous for is his Y portfolio and his X portfolio. So this was also kind of like a memento mori, but a more specific one, which is called a vanitas. Um, these would be the types of paintings that were really popular with the Dutch uh, a few hundred years before this. And the idea was is that life is short and the things that are beautiful in life um, or are luxuries in life uh, aren't worth as much as the eternity um, that you would have in the afterlife. Uh, so this was a Christian point of view where Christians believe in an afterlife where you can go to heaven or you can go to hell. Um, so the way that Maplethorpe looked at it was a little bit different. Uh, he looked at it as, yes, I'm going to show things like flowers um, that are beautiful things that don't last a long time, but he's also going to show other things that are pleasures of this life. And instead of having that kind of judgment you would have um, from the Dutch paintings, which says you shouldn't spend money on luxuries or enjoy beautiful things uh, because uh, it's better to be humble and to be thrifty so that you can live uh, in the afterlife. So this parrot tulip was part of his Y portfolio. And then when he did the X portfolio, it was mostly pictures of beautiful men naked. Um, and many of the pictures were much more explicit than the one that you're seeing here. So what happened with this particular picture is that it played, um, there was an exhibition uh, after Maplethorpe's death. And um, the exhibition was at a gallery and um, the people who ran the gallery uh, didn't really think about it too much. They they had like an age limit, like you had to be a grown up to be able to come in and see. Uh, but they didn't really think about it too much other than that. Uh, what happened is there was, they were sued um, by some local organizations. I believe it was some church organizations in court to say that what they were doing with this um, export portfolio was obscene. So it's interesting to see what ended up happening with this particular um, portfolio is that it went to court um, and they explained some of the things that I explained to you here. They explained the connection with Vanitas, with the pleasures of life. And it was a jury trial. So the jury decided, you know what? This isn't obscenity. This is art. Um, this is something that is beautiful and it's talking about the pleasures of life as art had in the past. Um, so after his death, Maplethorpe kind of got um, vindicated in a way. I should mention though that um, when these photographs came out, because they were mostly black men and kind of focusing on black men that were very muscular and with very large penises, that some people saw it as fetishizing black men, which can sometimes be a problem uh, amongst white men, especially in the gay community, um, although it can certainly happen 
um, with heterosexual people too, who tend to uh, have this stereotype about people uh, that are from other parts of the world that isn't Europe, uh, that they're somehow more sexual than other people. And that certainly applies uh, to Africans in this case. So it was kind of a racist view um, and Maplethorpe wasn't necessarily um, unaware of this, uh, but he also uh, did the photographs anyway. So he did a lot of interesting things with his photographs. This one, which is Lisa Lyon from 1982, um, she was the winner of the first women's bodybuilding championship in 1979. Um, and if you watch women's bodybuilding nowadays, they have divisions, but they have certain divisions where women basically try to get as big as possible. Uh, and then other div divisions that they call figure competitions, where women more look more like what we see with Lisa Lyon. Um, so, but at this time in the late 70s, even though you would see women like actresses, for instance, that are working in action movies, uh, that would be... Um, this ripped, in other words, um, this muscular and also lean at the same time. This is very uncommon for women at the time. Uh, so it was kind of seen as a challenge. Men's bodybuilding had become more popular, uh, especially with um, Arnold Schwarzenegger in the movie called Pumping Iron, which also had Lou Ferrigno in it. Um, and people at this time thought that uh, this is something very masculine to do. And the male bodybuilders generally tried to get as big as possible. Um, so in 1979, women who were entering these contests, they didn't have divisions. So they just, the women that happened to enter, they all did what is basically the equivalent of the figure competition nowadays, where they tried to stay pretty slim and not get too bulky. Um, however, in later competitions, uh, women started to come in to get much larger. Obviously, according to the standards that they had set up, um, these women should win, but it became a conflict. But even um, within the conflict where someone like Lisa Lyon is seen as more feminine and then her larger competitors were seen as more masculine, um, in this case, uh, she is kind of in some ways um, subverting or contesting conventional representations of the female figure. So going back to ancient Greece, you would often see women, they would be portrayed with lots of kind of curvy lines. Uh, and you wouldn't see women making a shape, for instance, like this, that is very perpendicular. Um, instead, you would see women making all kinds of um, kind of curvaceous shapes. Uh, so in this way, she's kind of subverting gender, something that Maplethorpe would, was definitely interested in. So this artist is a Polish artist, um, and he had lived in Poland uh, when they were part of the kind of coalition with the Soviet Union, uh, and Polish was a Marxist-Leninist government like the Soviet Union, and some Polish people thought they were dominated by the Soviet Union, uh, which in some cases was true. Um, so many people started to leave, and eventually there was a Polish uprising, which pretty much directly led to the end of the Soviet Union. Um, but Krzysztof Wodzisko, he actually left um, Poland before uh, the fall of the Soviet Union. But he had heard a lot of kind of stories about what the United States would be like. Like the United States at this time and still today uh, was the wealthiest country that ever existed in the history of the world. Uh, so he imagined somewhat naively that, you know, when he went to New York, you know, everyone would be driving Rolls Royces and and sitting on solid gold toilet seats and the, the streets would be paved with gold. Not quite that extreme. But what he did see when he got to New York uh, was the center of the wealthiest empire in the world, the wealthiest city in it. Um, and he saw 70,000 homeless people. Um, and there's still tens of thousands of homeless people in New York today. And being homeless in New York can be very difficult um, besides having to deal with police and business owners. Uh, it also can be very cold. So one of the problems with being homeless 
is that um, your life can lack dignity. Uh, anywhere you might sleep, um, people will try to kick you out of it, uh, even if it's a public area. Um, if you have to go to the bathroom, a lot of times businesses won't let you in, most of the time nowadays, uh, because there's been kind of a war against homeless people, not against homelessness, unfortunately, in New York. Um, so what he wanted to do is, he was really surprised that this was happening, but once he learned more about the United States, not so surprised uh, that this would happen. He wanted to give um, people a chance to have some dignity. So he made this homeless vehicle. You can see what it does is it takes care of some of the issues that homeless people would have besides not having a home. Uh, and one of those is privacy. Uh, so he shows that you could sleep inside the homeless vehicle and then you can also wash up. Um, and you could have a place to sit where you could also, you know, not having people trying to stare at you. Um, so this, in a way, could be an example of, of activist art. Uh, in other words, it's not art just for aesthetic purposes, but it's art, um, not even in this case, just to bring attention to an issue, uh, but to actually try to help a particular political issue. So keeping along those lines of activist art, this is a performance piece by Suzanne Lacey and Leslie Labowitz. It's called In Mourning and In Rage from 1977. Uh, and they performed this at L.A. City Hall. And what they were protesting was violence against women. Uh, at this time in Los Angeles, there was a serial killer who came to be known as the Hillside Strangler. And what they did is they dressed up as these kind of mourners uh, with these things attached to their heads so they'd be much taller uh, to represent the Strangler victims. Um, but the critique wasn't necessarily pointed towards the Hillside Strangler. There's always going to be individual violent people, individual violent men who will um, exert violence against women. Um, but instead, what they were thinking about is how the media portrayed it as this sensationalist story. And they talked about it every night. And they were thinking about it in a way that they could make money from the story. Uh, and Leibowitz and Lacey, they saw this as profiting off the torture and and murder of women. Um, so they, they saw this as not only distasteful, uh, but also something that is taking pain and suffering uh, and turning it into profit. Uh, so in this particular piece, they're just trying to call attention that who should really be, um, who we should really be thinking about is women that suffer this kind of violence and a culture that fetishizes, there's that word again, violence against women. So art, politics, and public space. I talked about in the first lecture a little bit about how there was a lot of public funding during the Great Depression in the 1930s to go towards art. And that continued um, until pretty much the 1970s when bit by bit it began to be taken away. Uh, but starting in the 1960s, uh, the National Endowment for the Arts was established. So this is basically government money that could go towards financing art shows, financing artists. And then in this case, as part of uh, their plan, 1% would go to art and public spaces. And the ideas with um, the art and public spaces program was that a lot of times people are only exposed to art in museums. Uh, and a lot of people don't necessarily go to museums or even have access to it. And one way that they could expose people to art uh, and perhaps get people to appreciate the art and also help the artists along as well um, is just by putting it in front of people's face. And when they see it every day, um, they might start to change their minds. They might say, well, um, I thought at first abstract art was was kind of pointless or... Or I looked at it and said, my kid could do that. Uh, but by being exposed to it every day, um, people started to appreciate it. Uh, and I think this is a really good choice from Alexander Calder, um, who is known for making mobiles. Uh, so think of those things that are above baby's cribs. But he made these mobiles that were really huge. And they weren't motorized. They would just move uh, from 
very, very, very slowly and create different shapes over time. Uh, so with this piece, which is called La Grande Vitesse, it's part of a series of pieces that are made out of metal. Uh, he liked to use red, black, white, um, the primary colors, because you believe that you could speak to people universally. These are colors that all humans um, recognize, uh, and all humans might have different types of meaning that they associate with these colors, but all of them have meaning with black, whites, and reds. So to him, this is a way to universally speak to people, even if they weren't familiar with art from a particular culture. So with these pieces, they try to do art for art's sake. In other words, it's something that you can appreciate on its own, uh, in some ways separate from its meaning. So when this first, was first erected in Grand Rapids, Michigan, uh, people reacted and they said, wow, I can't believe how much money was spent on this thing. It wasn't actually very much money at all. Um, and they said, this is stupid. I hate it. Why do we put this up here? Um, but over time, people came, saw it again and again, and the city of Grand Rapids uh, eventually became kind of an art center. So in Michigan, there's an art center in Detroit. Uh, there's an art center in Ann Arbor around the University of Michigan. Um, but Grand Rapids became another art center, partially because of the attention that came from La Grande Vitesse that we're looking at right here. Uh, so initial resistance, but nowadays um, Grand Rapids basically uses this piece as a symbol for the city, as a new city that is the city of the arts. Uh, and they've done a really good job with that. So this is, you can kind of look at it again as a case of almost an unintentional uh, activist art that uh, had an effect on the city. So whenever you see some of these Alexander Calder pieces, so if you don't get a chance to go to Grand Rapids, there's also a cool piece of his in, in front of the Toledo Museum of Art outdoors. You can always find his signature. So an A, C, uh, kind of duogram right there. Uh, and then 1969, the year that it was made. So as you might imagine, he's not necessarily making this with his own hands. Uh, there's many, many people that go into making it because it's painted steel plate. You know, it's huge. It's like a, making a bridge or something. So this piece, again, a public art piece by Charlie, Charles Simmons was called Dwellings. And his idea was to create these tiny cities, uh, little people cities. So you might not be able to see the scale here, but I'll save you a picture in a moment. And he created two of, 200 of these in the Lower East Side of Manhattan in the early 80s. Uh, so New York City in the 80s, there were places that were extremely wealthy, uh, and there were also places that were very poor, and then places that were un underutilized. Um, so sometimes you would go by and you see buildings were crumbling. So he'd take some of these spaces and recreate these little people cities, um, 200 in the Lower East Side of Manhattan, 100 more uh, from Ireland to China. And what he noticed was really cool. He set up some cameras around them, um, and he took some pictures and kind of see the little city in here. And he would just like not tell anybody it was there. And he noticed that kids especially would often take artifacts from the little people race, you know? Um, so you can imagine when you're a kid, you might think, wow, there really are tiny people and they're making things and we just have to, to look. Um, so this type of art is really unconventional, uh, kind of like what I've been talking about before. Uh, with some of the art of Nam June Paik, um, art that really involves the viewer. So this is a style of art, which is still made today and still pretty popular. You can do some amazing things with computers with this style called opt art, op art. Um, in other words, optical art. Um, and as I'm showing you this picture, it's kind of helpful if you stare at the middle of the picture um, because as you do over time, you'll probably notice that the picture begins to move. And as you keep staring, you might get kind of a flow, either downwards or upwards, depending on how you look at things. Uh, so kind of look towards the middle and you might see it as like a flowing river. 
Um, it helps if you kind of sit back from it a little bit. If you're on a computer, you know, you don't have to sit back that far. But if you're looking at a big screen like I am right now, it's helpful to get far farther back. Uh, so these types of pieces use the science of optics, um, the types of things that um, neuroscientists uh, like to study, these kind of visual tricks, and understand a little bit about how the human mind works. Uh, so this is a very scientific type of um, art that Bridget Riley is making. So I'll warn you with this next slide, uh, it can be very... Um, intense for some people. Uh, so I'll go to it. This is our piece called Suspension. Um, and I think it's useful to think about what you see. Uh, so you can pause it right now and look at it for a little while and kind of answer the question in your head. So pause it. And then when you come back, most of you probably saw something that looked like stairs. But what's interesting is think about which part of the stairs is the horizontal element and which part is the vertical element. So sometimes when people look at the picture, they see this first layer and they say, that's horizontal. And then this is vertical, horizontal, vertical. But then you might look at it again and all of a sudden, this part will become vertical and this part will become horizontal. You don't even have to look away at the picture. You might want to look away from the picture because, uh, again, this can almost start to vibrate in a way that can be uncomfortable for people. So this art, in, in a different way than what we've seen before, but it's still kind of having the same purpose. It's involving the viewer in the art and somewhat breaking down some of the um, barriers between art and the viewer. So this is Chuck Close. And he did something that a lot of people do nowadays uh, in art classes. He would take a grid of a photograph, um, so like this. Uh, you, this is a photograph of um, Philip Glass, who became a famous composer later on. Uh, he's done a lot of music um, that you may have heard. Uh, he was in a lot of films. Um, but he's kind of known for making these very, very interesting, repetitive type of music. Um, and so what he would do is he'd take a photograph and then make a grid out of it like this. And then when he painted the finished picture, instead of painting the entire picture, he would just look at each square and paint what it was ever in each square. And you can see the scale of it. This is Chuck Close sitting next to it right here. Uh, it's this tremendous scale and it creates this like incredible effect. And artists in the past had actually done this. For instance, uh, in the early Renaissance, artists had a lot of trouble with trying to create things that look realistic if they had bodies in them because bodies have lines going that are curved and shapes that are very complex. So they would sometimes use these grids to kind of place things and to help them. Um, these types of grids would also be used if you wanted to mass produce art at a large scale. So in China and the Soviet Union, especially this was used to make um, kind of like political posters um, on walls uh, and paint huge versions of things because it makes it a little bit easier to recreate them. So what's interesting about Close is that he found out, uh, so he got kind of more and more abstract where he would put um, just like the tiniest abstractions inside of the squares, and you notice that it would still end up looking like the finished picture. Uh, so you can see it with this one. Uh, this is super cool. This is similar to one that's at the Toledo Museum of Art. If you stand really close to it, it looks like on the left. But then when you come back, it looks, again, very photorealistic. Uh, so what Chuck Close found out about himself um, just a few years ago, actually, uh, about 10, 15 years ago, is that he has face blindness. And if you're not familiar with this, uh, face blindness means that when you see people, uh, even if you know them really well, you can't recognize their face. Um, so this might sound kind of odd for an artist who's creating these photorealistic paintings to have this particular condition. Um, so most humans... We just recognize faces because that's the way we work. We're a visual species. 
uh, and every human can recognize faces. Babies can recognize faces once they can see well enough. Um, but sometimes people have this problem in their brain and the faces just become a bunch of lines and colors and they can't really put them together. So he figured out that what he had been doing his entire life was he'd look at details of people's faces and then he kind of put those together in his head and that's how he could recognize people. Um, so we kind of in retrospect, look at this technique as a way for him to deal with his face blindness. Um, but this type of thing can be used uh, in a very interesting way. Uh, so I'm gonna include a link to a picture of George Bush where um, like these Chuck Close pictures, it's made out of squares, but inside of each of the squares is a picture of a soldier who had died in um, the Iraq war. Uh, so at the time the picture was made, uh, there had only been 750 soldiers that had died. Uh, since then, uh, there's been 4,000 more U.S. soldiers that had died and somewhere between 600,000 to a million Iraqis that had died. Uh, so this can be kind of used to show, um, in the case of this Bush picture, a responsibility. So I'll include a link to a very high-resolution version of that picture so you can check it out. Um, so that's the end of lecture number three.